Welcome to AgriFood Conversations, brought to you by iSelect, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. I'm Hannah Hund, an analyst on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to welcome you all to today's discussion. AgriFood Conversations is all about driving innovation in agriculture. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, including emerging topics such as soil health, plant genetics, vertical farming, and aquaculture, to name a few. This month's theme is Food is Health, and on today's call, we are joined by David Kyle, Executive Chairman and CSO of Evolve Biosystems. Evolve Biosystems is dedicated to developing the next generation of products to establish, restore, and maintain a healthy newborn gut microbiome. Building on a decade of expertise in the partnership between the infant gut microbiome and human breast milk, Evolve is solving newborn gut dysbiosis, or an imbalance of beneficial bacteria, through microbiome-based interventions in both human and animal health. Each of you knows companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We've invited you to this call because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in Evolve Biosystems market. You are potential customers for Evolve Biosystems products and services. You have built a company similar to Evolve Biosystems, or you are a sophisticated business person or agricultural professional who understands the market and the challenges and opportunities Evolve Biosystems may face. Before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who's on the call. If you could take a few moments to answer that, that would be great. A few process comments while you're filling out that poll. We are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to provide information to help Evolve Biosystems find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. You are all on mute. You can use the chat window to ask a question at any time. This presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I'm pleased to introduce David Kyle, Executive Chairman and CSO of Evolve Biosystems. Well, thank you, Hannah, and thank you for providing me the opportunity to share the, um, the, the Evolve story. It's kind of a story about the quintessential food uh, as we're talking about uh, babies. Um, should I just go ahead and advance this straight to the presentation? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. So once again, I hope everybody is, uh, is at, uh, safely sheltering at home and uh, staying safe and working your way through this uh, incredible time in our history. Um, and these webinars really make it, uh, make it work a little bit easier for the, for the rest of us. So I'm going to start off with, uh, again, a brief uh, self-introduction here. I'm a 35-year veteran of biotech in the field of infant nutrition and health. I've published over 70 scientific articles, edited two books. I'm the named inventor on over 250 patents. I founded a comp another food company in, in the infant space, Martech Biosciences, back in 1985, a long time ago, best known for bringing uh, DHA and ARA into infant nutrition products worldwide. Uh, it was a very successful company. It went public uh, and was acquired in 2011 for $1.1 billion by DSM. Uh, I was inducted in, into the U.S. Technology Hall of Fame in 2009 for the work that we had done because it really had impacts worldwide. It wasn't just a, a, a technology success, but I think it was a, a human success as well, too. I joined the Evolve Biosystems team in 2013. Um, and I want to just start off briefly with the proposition of Evolve's business in terms of uh, in individual bullet points. So it started with a breaking discovery like most, most new startup companies. This one was about a single gut bacterium uniquely linked to breast milk that protects baby from opportunistic gut pathogen invasion. And that invasion that we now believe is linked to this uh, pandemic of autoimmune dis conditions that we're seeing worldwide today. The problem is that this bacteria has been lost over the past hundred years in the developed world. Our solution is that this company was the first ever to provide clinical proof that you could actually restore that natural bike microbiome to babies. And now we understand what it was doing in the first place and providing this natural protective mechanism, a clearly important natural protective mechanism. The protection of the company is really based on IP. 
Uh, and we have a robust IP position that uh, includes uh, 30 patents uh, of the University of California Davis, of which we are the uh, exclusive worldwide licensee, as well as a number of uh, pending evolved patents since we've uh, acquired that initial uh, patent protection set. The potential market is worldwide, although we're talking mostly about the US today. Worldwide market potential is uh, over $5 billion. Uh, we are a company that at the moment is generating revenue from two products. One is a consumer product, which we call Evivo. Uh, and we've delivered uh, over 2 million uh, feedings or servings uh, of that product uh, since we launched it about a year and a half ago. And we also have a B2B product, which goes directly to hospitals for those babies that are hospitalized in the NICUs. And we're in over 25 NICUs across the country. And, and we believe, I think uh, it, it will be vindicated by the presentation that we are really the leaders in the infant gut microbiome space based on our worldwide commercial or academic relationships. However, that may be a big fish in a small pond, but uh, I'll leave that to you to, uh, to decide. So some of the groups we're working with around the world, who are, who some of whom are investors, are the likes of uh, the philanthropic organizations like the Gates Foundation, Lee Ka Shing Foundation, um, big name schools, Stanford, Wash, uh, um, uh, Wash U, Harvard. Uh, we're working with uh, Karolinska Institute, the A-Star group in Singapore, Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong, King, we run trials at King's College. We're dealing with virtually everybody across the world, although I'm gonna be, again, focusing really on the US uh, where this discovery was made and how we're building our business. So a quick financial history of Evolve Biosciences. Uh, we were, it was spun off from the UC Davis Foods for Health Institute in 2012. We quickly in-licensed technology from the UC Davis. Um, that gave us multiple layers of patent protection. Since that time, I joined the company in 2013 and facilitated that spinoff. Since that time, we've raised over, four, over $70 million to fund continued research and commercialization. Uh, our last financing rouse was in 2018, where we had a $135 million post-financing um, valuation. Um, just for full transparency, we're, we are in the process of a, of a Series D round. Uh, at this point as well, since uh, a lot of things have happened in the last two years. Um, so if we look at the investors, who, who the type of investors, we find mostly food tech investors. So our very first seed round was led by Tate and, Tate and Lyle Ventures in 2014. The following year, Horizons, who was also another big investor in, in uh, food science, uh, led the Series A round of another $9 million. Uh, in 2017, two years later, uh, the, the B round uh, was led by Spruce Capital. Again, these will be names that I'm sure you're familiar with and Acre. Bow Capital is based on the uh, retirement funds from the University of California system. Uh, but we had each of our previous investors invest along with each subsequent investment. And, and uh, in 2018, a year later, a $40 million Series C led by Horizons and the Gates Foundation. We added some additional strategics, including J&J, JJDC, uh, Continental Grain and Arla uh, food ingredients, Arla being the largest um, uh, uh, dairy cooperative in Europe. So I'll start the story, like all stories, it starts with a scientific breakthrough, right? That was the first bit, and this was, took many years of work, and I want to uh, just uh, reach out to our, our scientific founders. They're the ones that were responsible for the initiation of this company through the discoveries they were making early, uh, you know, even 15 years ago. Bruce German, who was supposed to give this talk, and uh, I feel... Um, uh, a, a bit shy about stepping into his uh, place because he certainly is a much more dynamic talker than I am and, and uh, is a brilliant scientist and, and really brings this uh, story to life as well. But these are um, five scientists from different disciplines, all working together at UC Davis on the same general concept. Four remaining scientists there now. Samara, Dr. Freeman, is, uh, joined the company uh, some time ago, and she leads our intellectual property uh, component of the company. But they're all working on one thing. And again, back to the quintessential nutrition source is human milk. It's the sole source of nutrition for all in, for infants in the first few months of life. And that's really important because uh, it's the only time in our life history that we depend on a single source of nutrition. So that makes the, the breastfed infant a very unique situation. 
But remember too that this has been perfected for millions of years of evolution to provide everything that that baby needs, every single thing that that baby needs. And so the observation that this, this team made early on when they started uh, taking apart the components of breast milk and finding that uh, lactose, lipids, proteins, that makes up 85% of the component uh, of, uh, of the uh, caloric component of uh, breast milk is really food for the baby. But there was this other component representing 15% of the energy called uh, human milk oligosaccharides. There are a series of complex sugar molecules, very unusual, you don't find it anywhere else in nature, uh, except in some cases other mammalian milks, but certainly uh, very unique. And um, it, was a, it was a real puzzle as to what this was for because we as humans don't have the genetic or biochemical ma machinery to deconstruct or utilize that as an energy source. So on, on, on the surface, it looks like 15% of the energy content of breast milk is actually going right through the baby and into the diaper because the baby can't consume it. Well, it turns out after work uh, by that team that I just showed you that, uh, that they initially decided that, well, it must be, uh, it looks like a soluble fiber. It must be food for the uh, microbiome in that baby. Um, and who would ever thought of human milk as being a high fiber beverage? But it certainly is at 15% of that energy. But then they found that almost no gut bacteria could consume those milk oligosaccharides either. And that became a real enigma and kudos to these scientists that continue to persevere with these uh, rather troubling observations that didn't make sense at first um, until, and they actually found one organism, a Bifidobacterial longum subspecies infantis. Uh, and it seemed to be the only organism they could come up with that was capable of the complete digestion of all those HMOs in the human gut. So it was uniquely adapted for the human gut. And when that was discovered, they quickly ran the sequence of this organism and say, well, why is it so special? And it contains a number of genes that are quite different than everybody else. And, and uh, a lot of these are associated with uh, HMO metabolism unique to this particular organism. It also consumes the milk oligosaccharides in an unusual way. Many of those genes are associated with extracellular binding proteins that capture those milk oligosaccharides and then hands off to a transporter that transports those complex oligosaccharides internally into the cell. And that's when a whole series of uh, glycosyl hydrolases go to work and start chopping up those, uh, those complex sugars into simple sugars that then feed into the um, metabolic processes of that organism uh, what the end point of which is lactate and acetate. So it's busily converting HMO undigestible to the baby to acetate and lactate, which by the way, are powerful, high value, high energy food sources for that infant gut. So baby is not losing that 15% uh, of energy at all. It's just being converted from HMOs in the lower gut to acetate and lactate, which in addition to uh, being a nutritional source also is our acidic molecules and they lower the pH. So this was a really cool observation. Human milk is a selective growth medium for B. infantis. How cool is that? Why did nature design it that way? We didn't know at that time. Um, but what it did say was that, that every breastfed baby, if you look at the stools of the breastfed babies, they should be dominated by this organism, B. infantis. And then the next observation came up is when they started looking they couldn't find it. They couldn't find it in baby poop in Davis. They couldn't find it across the US or in many other places in the world. And only when they started doing some work in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa uh, with native populations um, and Bangladeshi populations did they find that, wow, in those babies, this organism, B. infantis, is dominating the gut, just as predicted by nature, to levels of 75 and 80%. So it's somehow missing in uh, the Western world, but it's uh, there in the developing nations of the world. So the first thing we decided to do was to introduce this B. infantis back to the Western world. And so we initiated a cl clinical trial called the imprint trial right here in Davis. Uh, and the study design was a, a controlled trial. We had 66 mother infant dyads, divided them into two groups, supplemented one group with, um, uh, with our own strain of activated B. infantis, EVC001, you'll see that, that uh, moniker a lot, EVC001. We only fed them for 21 days and um, all moms were be breastfeeding their babies. Uh, the control arm was just the standard of care of exclusive breastfed babies. And then we looked at the results and, and what we found 
was uh, quite interesting. We were just looking at the microbiome. We were just really looking at the first two months of life. We found in the control group of babies, high levels of pathogens. We didn't find any B. infantis, which is uh, consistent with what they found before. Um, but that didn't seem unusual because that was pretty similar to all the literature. And I'll just show you what these data look like. So these vertical bars uh, represent, and the different colors represent different families of these bacteria. And so you'll see things like um, bifido, that's the bifido bacteria, bacteria, bacteria. Uh, Enterobacteriaceae, these are families. So within these families, there's many different genera and so on. So you'd find E. coli in there and Klebsiella, Clostridia, you've probably heard of before, C. perfengens or, or C. difficile and Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. But it, it's rather surprising that there's such a high proportion of all these uh, potential pathogenic organisms, but that's what everybody else was finding too. So it didn't really seem unusual until we looked at the EVC001 group or when we've supplied the B infantis to that group, it was amazing. Um, not only was there an 80% reduction of those pathogens, as you can see by the colored bars getting all scrunched down, but the response was 100%. Every baby that got the, got the supplement with the B infantis um, ended up with a microbiome that looked consistently and uniformly like that one on the right. It was literally dominated by the B infantis looking very similar to what they were seeing in some of the um, uh, emerging nations of the world. And the other interesting feature was we stopped feeding, if you call it 21 days, but even after 28 days, even after 30 days and 40 days, as long as those babies were continuing to get a constant amount of the food for that B. infantis, selective food for that B. infantis, i.e. breast milk, that level stayed high. That has never been shown before for any kind of probiotic supplementation. So we, that's when we realized this is really not a probiotic at all. To get some more clarity of what the reductions actually work were, we looked at the, the potential pathogens as identified by virulent factors in the DNA. So we could do that fairly easily. And we knew that those virulent forms of these organisms were the ones that were associated with endotoxins and late onset sepsis and necrotizing endocolitis in the, in the NICUs. And what we found, and this was also been published just uh, um, last year, is that we saw things like Clostridium difficile, C. perfengens, the Streptococcus, Klebsiella, Staphylococcus, E. coli, all being reduced by over 90%. And since most of the um, antibiotic, antibiotic resistance genes that we have in our body, and all of us listening to this, to this conversation, uh, they're mostly all associated with E. coli. And so when we just polled the, the, um, the level of antibiotic resistance gene load carriage in these babies, we saw that was also reduced by 90%, which was, um, gave us an interesting insight that we shared with the CDC that a newborn baby that is dysbiotic, i.e. our control babies, are uh, an interesting potential vector for community um, uh, spread of antimicrobial resistance genes. <laughs> But by putting the natural microbiome back into these babies, we certainly reduced that significantly. So how is it reducing those pathogens? Well, remember what we said earlier that it was converting these HMOs into acetate and lactate. It was lowering the gut uh, pH, and here's the data. So it lowered the pH by um, about one whole pH unit, which is uh, a logarithmic unit, as you remember, it's huge. And once you get down to below a pH of 5.5, you're in a position where a lot of these opportunistic pathogens really do not grow. And so um, when we look at uh, very old data back in the 1920s at, um, at stool pH, because people were actually measuring stool pH in the 1920s, guess what they found? They found back in the 1920s, the stool pHs were down at 4.8 to 5.1. Today, virtually every baby born in the United States in the first few months of life has a stool pH of 6 to 6.5. So there was a major change. We went back, historically looked at this over a bunch of clinical trials where they actually measured stool pH. And lo and behold, there has been a steady increase in infant stool pH over the last 100 years associated with this loss of B. infantis from the population. So a company that you may all be aware of, LabCorp, uh, they're probably the largest uh, diagnostics, um, uh, healthcare diagnostics company in the world. Uh, we shared this information with them because they were publishing that the, that the healthy infant pH range for fecal pH was 7.0 to 7.5. We said, no, 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 that's quite wrong. And here's our reasons. 
And after discussions with them that lasted about six months, they finally said, thank you very much for bringing this important issue to our attention, and they changed it. So now the reference interval of this major corporation, they've just changed the healthy pH range down to 4.5 to 5.5. This is, this is a great benefit to the babies, but it's certainly a great benefit to the company as well too, because now it opens up a potential for insurance company of uh, babies that are identified with a higher level of pH or an unhealthy level of pH. It also gives pediatricians uh, a target with which they can uh, address the question, i.e. give those babies uh, the B infantis. So uh, another thing that, was, uh, that we identified early, and then we'll kind of wrap up the science and talk more about the business, was that as we were monitoring the stools for the HMOs, we found that uh, in the babies um, that were our control babies, most of those HMOs were going right in the top end, right out the bottom end of those babies. But in addition to that, we were seeing a lot of glycans or complex sugar structures that are generally associated with mucin. So the picture on the left represents uh, gut intestinal epithelia as it probably exists in nature with um, a very large and thick layer of mucin or a mucus layer actually providing a lot of protection to that gut. It, it prevents the in, uh, immediate contact of pathogens with the gut cells themselves. This mucin layer, it's kind of a hydrocolloid. And it's a hydrocolloid based on the fact that the mucin protein itself is highly glycosylated. So what we found in the, in the control babies who are getting nothing but human milk, so they're not really getting any fiber other than HMO that they can't eat, is that they're in there starving. And so uh, they have the ability to clip glycans off of mucin. And by clipping the glycans off of mucin, why would they do that? Well, it's simple, because that's the food for them. So they eat that, but it also destroys that mucus layer or it certainly erodes that mucus layer. And so the excess of these mucin glycans we found in the control babies was, was evidence for us that the mucus layer was being, was being uh, eroded away by these other commensal bacteria in the control situation, but prevented in those with B. infantis. Again, this was published last year as well too. Um, we're in the habit of publishing all the data that we find, which is a little different than many other biotech companies, but nevertheless, you can find that the validation of the, of the peer-reviewed publication is always useful. Um, so what happens if that, if you erode away that mucus layer is now you have some of these uh, enteric pathogens coming in direct contact with that epithelial layer. And that what happens next is like somebody dropping a hot coal into your hand. The response is immediate and it is a significant one. And that is to mount an inflammatory response. And that inflammatory response can be signaled by a bunch of pro-inflammatory markers. It results in, in the separation of the cells, making the gut leaky, um, and, a, and a number of other responses. So we said, well, we should look for inflammatory markers in the, in the stools of the control and the, and the um, in vivo babies and see if we find a difference. And we did a major difference. So here is uh, just one. I'll just mention a couple of these. This is IL-1 beta. It's a pro-inflammatory marker. It's there when there's high levels of inflammation. The curves on the left, the gray bars are the control babies, and the little tiny teal bars, which look more like lines, um, are the EBC-001 babies. So a lot of variability in the controls, no variability in the e vivo babies. They all have um, basically an immunological homeostasis whereas the babies uh, at 60 days, at 40 days, and at 60 days are really chronically inflamed. And these are, the, these are the gold standard babies of ours, right? These are vaginally delivered breastfed babies, and yet they're exhibiting chronic enteric inflammation. At levels in that circled value there, those are levels that in, in vitro cell culture are enough to disrupt uh, cell junctions and make cells leaky in vitro. So they're physiological levels, 55 times less in the, in the natural gut microbiome. And we find the same thing with others. Here in this case, interferon gamma, same response. Here is uh, fecal calprotectin. That's uh, another measure of inflammation in the gut. And I put this one in in particular because there was a study that came out of uh, Scandinavia about eight eight or nine years ago that looked at fecal calprotectin levels in stools of infants at 60 days of age, same as ours. And they, and they followed them forward for the next five years and looked for the impact on um, atopy and asthma. And they found that if they were at levels marked by that red dashed line around 500 micrograms per milligram, there was a twofold increase 
in the, in the uh, prevalence of atopy and asthma at, at later in life. And that's, that's, that's right about where our median is of our control babies. Man. Anyway, um, moving on, we, we published that one. That, made, uh, that was so impactful because no one really had realized that our outwardly healthy babies have chronic enteric inflammation is that it made the cover of pediatric research in December of last year. And we can see on there, they listed out specifically our EVC001 and talked about the cytokines, talked about the leaky gut. Um, and what's important about this is the adaptive immune response is going to school in that first 100 days of life. It's doing pattern recognition. It's determining what I should react to and what I shouldn't react to. And, and now we can see in this trial, it's doing it under two different conditions. One condition under a calm uh, immunological homeostasis. And in the second condition, which are the, which are the control babies, under a hyperinflamed environment. So we believe that this is the fundamental um, trigger point for a lot of autoimmune and allergic conditions that appear later in life because of this early disruption. So uh, last question, why is it missing? Um, it, again, like most things in our modern world, unintended consequences. In this particular case, if we think of where baby would normally get that B infantis from, it comes from the delivery process, which for 5 million years has been vaginal delivery. Um, and it comes not from the vaginal microbiome, but it comes from mom's uh, gut microbiome. And so as she's delivering the baby, she 95% of the time will also defecate. And that actually is a, is a transfer, <laughs> quintessential fecal microbial transfer under levels of generally low hygiene for most of our evolutionary process, um, has been an inoculum of a healthy gut microbiome from the mom to the baby at the same time as birth. Now, today, um, the woman giving, giving birth to her first baby uh, has had, on average, from the time she was born, 15 to 20 courses of antibiotics. Uh, antibiotics, as we know, decrease our gut microbiome diversity significantly, and bifidobacteria is extremely sensitive to, to, to antibiotics. And so that is probably the primary reason why mom doesn't have um, B. infantis in her to pass on to her baby. If she doesn't have it, she can't pass it on to her baby. The baby can't get it from anywhere else. Um, likewise, cesarean section births usually associated with the use of antibiotics, um, but in addition to that, that baby is uh, not getting nowhere near mom's uh, fecal material. So even if mom did have it, it's not gonna get transferred to the baby. So that's probably the reason why we saw this curve that I talked about earlier and the progressive loss over the last century of B. infantis from our population. So now I can tell you something that you already know um, in addition to COVID, uh, COVID, the COVID virus is we've had, a, we've had probably a much more profound pandemic in our developed world of which we have no uh, choice of using vaccines or we have no understanding of where it's come from. And that is this uh, preponderance of autoimmune conditions that we've seen over the last maybe 50 years. Uh, atopic dermatitis or eczema, uh, food allergies. Uh, I know how many of you, when you went to school, went to school with peanut butter sandwiches, um, but now we can't do that anymore. Asthma, juvenile diabetes, all of these have increased in prevalence in various areas around the world by over four or five fold in the last 50 years. The only places where it hasn't increased in prevalence is in those third world countries, in those developing nations uh, that have this natural gut microbiome. Interesting. So the big picture is, if we're right and we can reestablish that natural microbiome so easily by providing this supplement, then, and that goes on to protect the immune, natural development of the immune system, can we reverse the uh, prevalence of these autoimmune disorders like type 1 diabetes and asthma and atopy back to the levels it was in the 1920s. We can certainly restore the microbiome back to the 1920s, which is now equivalent to what some of the, the emerging countries of the world look like today. So we may have that outcome. That's kind of what's driving the company. So let's move on to the commercial opportunity and uh, talk a little bit about the business. So we entered the, um, the revenue generating space with a consumer health product, as well as a product for hospitalized infants. Let's start with a consumer health issue or the consumer product. So autoimmune auto conditions 
as you will know, as you know, cost hundreds across the world, hundreds of billions of dollars. It's a huge cost burden that's just really crippling the healthcare system today. Um, and it, there's some numbers there in terms of the uh, some estimates of the annual cost per patient of these disorders for for a lifetime. So they're very high. I just want to. Um, to jump, uh, do a real quick sidebar, because I'm gonna mention this name again in, in a few minutes. Uh, Dick Insel and Mikhail Kip Knip, who wrote a, wrote, wrote a paper, published paper late in 2018 after, after talking about these issues with us. Mikhail is probably the leading uh, researcher in type one diabetes. He's in Helsinki, Finland. Dick Insel was the um, medical director for the uh, Juvenile Diabetes Research uh, Foundation. And they published this paper, and I just read the title, Prospects for the Primary Prevention of Type 1 Diabetes by Restoring a Disappearing Microbe. They're positing that, in fact, this is exactly what will happen if we do that intervention trial. So our, our opportunity as a, as, a, as a company isn't that worldwide annual number of births, so 133 million births every year in, in the world. It has to be uh, ratcheted down based on accessibility. So if we assign 100% uh, of the births accessible in US and Canada, and maybe close to that in Europe, China, we drop it to 15, India, we drop it to five. We end up with, um, with a number of about uh, 17 uh, million births per year. Um, our, right now, our um, value per infant is about $180 to, to change that gut microbiome. And that represents a $3.1 billion market size. We're focusing on the US right now, probably moving into China next and Europe shortly thereafter. This is the product that we sell in the US. It's uh, sold by an e-commerce platform uh, directly from Evolve or from Amazon, a one month starter kit. Uh, it comes as sachets, mom mixes uh, within that little bowl, mixes with the contents of the sachet, which is uh, about uh, half a gram of powder with a few mLs of breast milk, and then just gives it directly to the baby either on her finger or with that little syringe. We've sold over 2 million servings uh, to date, um, and that's what the consumer product work looks like. What clinical endpoints can we drive home with respect to that? Well, a normalization of stooling pattern it's another thing I didn't mention, but babies go home from the hospital today with an expectation of five to seven watery stools uh, per day for the first couple of months of life. In reality, that again, wasn't what it was like back in the 1920s. It was only uh, two to three soft stools per day. And that's what the stooling pattern changed to with our babies that have taken the, um, the Vivo. Over 90% reduction of major gut pathogens, uh, major reduction of antibiotic resistance gene carriage, prevention of the gut uh, mucus layer erosion, minimization of gut inflammation, improved biomarkers of immune tolerance. Um, and this is the, again, this is the product for, for home use. We're talking about uh, two to $3 a day. These are our reviews uh, on our own website. Um, but more interestingly, we did a, we did a uh, consumer survey of customers, around 1,500 customers, and the reports came back, 72% of these moms reported a, a significant improvement in diaper rash, 64% in colic, 52% in nighttime sleep, just by changing that gut microbiome back to its natural state. And we can explain these now because diaper rash occurs less often the lower the pH of the stool. Colic is usually as a consequence of large numbers of bacteria, gas pr producing bacteria in the gut, they're now all being replaced by the bifidobacteria. And the nighttime sleep, you know, a lot of serotonin is generated in the gut. Uh, when we looked at serotonin levels between the vivo babies and the, and the control babies, there was about uh, uh, one quarter the serotonin levels in the control babies that there were in, this, in, the, in the vivo babies. We're uh, initiating some clinical trials with higher value clinical endpoints. Uh, the ones in green have already been trialed and the funding has already been approved and they're ready to start. Uh, the one in yellow, uh, we've, got the, we've got the trial protocol completed. We're looking for funding. That's a very large one, 2,000 babies per year over five years. That's 10,000 babies. Um, in order to look at the elimination of a condition that hasn't appeared yet, you have to have large numbers. And so these trials are, are large and take long times. Randomized control where we can make them. Um, but we'll see the point here is that over the next three or four years, you're going to be seeing significantly large trials uh, hitting the covers of JAMA and some of those uh, other uh, journals showing changes in the prevalence of these autoimmune disorders associated with this uh, particular treatment. 
The product for the NICU is different. Babies in the NICU predominantly are being fed with uh, NG tubes, so powders don't work. So we developed a product format where the powder is, is suspended in a, a special um, uh, food oil. It's, it's an MCT oil, medium chain triglyceride oil. M many of you probably know what that is, high energy oil. It's being manufactured in a dedicated ISO 8 clean room uh, by a producer that produces sterile injectables for all these pharma companies. So we feel that you can't get too high a quality control when you're um, dealing with these very fragile babies in the, in the NICU. Uh, the premium admission to discharge cost uh, to the insurance companies or to the hospitals is about, on average, $200,000 per baby. They're not all that expensive, but uh, the NICU daily cost alone is like $3,500 a day. If that baby's on total parenteral nutrition for a few days before going on to the enteral feeds, it's another $1,500 and so on. But if those babies are identified uh, with necrotizing enterocolitis, that's 200,000 alone just for that. It uh, requires a surgery generally. It's the thing that most hospitals and neonatologists are scared about and are trying to get rid of. Hospitals right now, if uh, your baby is a very low birth weight baby, hospitals run anywhere from 3% to 9% of those babies will end up dying of necrotizing enterocolitis. The cost of the preterm births in the US, 26 billion. Most of that is on these very low birth weight babies. 13 billion is spent on the 60,000 um, uh, very low birth weight babies in America today. EVC-001 is standard of care in many NICUs and has been for the last 18 months. We have over 30,000 uh, patient days in the NICU. And some of the things we're seeing now from the NICU, mostly from cohort studies, is again, what we saw in the term babies, 70% reduction of antibiotic resistance gene carriage. This is really important in the, in the hospital situation. 50% uh, reduction of diaper rash. This is also important, although it's not a, a life or death matter, it's a quality of a life and what they refer to in the NICU as a patient satisfaction and a caregiver satisfaction, uh, not seeing this rash on the, on, the, on the skin of the babies. But more important to the pharmacoeconomic angle is uh, we've seen um, 105 hour reduction of total parenteral nutrition. This is IV nutrition and a reduction in time of NICU stay of four and a half to five days. In this particular healthcare system, that accounted for $24,000 a day savings. So just on an economic point of view, um, this, is a, this is a great ROI for the, for the hospitals. Plus we're seeing from some of these hospitals that have used it now for uh, 18 to 24 months, a virtual elimination of necrotizing enterocolitis. That is a really, really big deal. We have over a thousand babies in one healthcare system. Now we're kind of rounding up all the data. Uh, and if we can establish that that is, a, that that is statistically significant, which we believe will, will be, then that's gonna really catapult the company forward. Uh, we're also running some more trials in NICUs. We have a late onset sepsis trial ready to start in Hong Kong. Uh, cohort data analysis, which I just mentioned on the NICUs from the US, um, and a clinical trial that's ongoing right now, Winnie Palmer. Winnie Palmer Hospital is the largest birthing hospital in the country. Um, and so they're obviously a great uh, potential customer for us. What do we do in terms of protecting the market? Um, well, validated science is important, uh, continuing to get that out, intellectual property, product differentiation. Uh, we're not a probiotic, we're not like uh, lactobacillus or LGG or Culturel or BB12 or any of these other things uh, because they don't do the operations that the B. infantis does. So we've got to make sure that's important. And we use uh, opinion leaders quite a bit. So just looking at from the last uh, financing, uh, the Series C, uh, in 2017, the increase in the issued patents has gone up threefold. We went from 10 to 30 issued patents. Uh, publications are actively publishing all this data. We went from four to about uh, uh, 16 now. Um, and uh, completed clinical trials. We really only had one completed and one started um, back at the last financing, and now we have uh, uh, many more clinical trials. And again, on the right, some of the organizations that we're working with in these areas. Uh, patent coverage, I'm not gonna cover in great detail. I like to look at this as, a, as an onion and having multiple layers of defense to protect these patents. So in the center of that onion, you see Evivo Consumer and Evivo Hospital 
The first three solid rings represent a number of patents that have already issued. Uh, the dotted ones are those that are still pending, but we're trying to build layer and layer and layer of protection around this particular technology. We also uh, you are using trademarks as IP protection, and uh, those are being filed uh, both in the US and worldwide. Uh, opinion leaders on the H HCP side, uh, we have an infant health advisory board made up of uh, prominent HCPs that have either been using our product, like Brian Scottolini at uh, OHSU, and for the last 18 months, to those actually doing research on the product, product like Carl Sylvester at Stanford, um, and others. So they're uh, a good uh, spokes group for us. On the consumer facing side, here just uh, represents uh, some earned media placement we got on the doctors. Uh, with our uh, spokesperson, Dr. Tanya Altman. So Dr. Tanya is uh, well known uh, to new moms as the pediatrician to go to uh, for any issues. So she speaks very highly, uh, using it not only in her own practice, but uh, with respect to the product itself. And finally, on the investor facing side to make sure that we constantly get good and solid um, and credentialed investors that help in their investment, actually credentialing the, com the company itself as well. So last couple of slides, we feel that we're in a position that uh, we've had these two products on the market now for 18 months or so. We're getting a feel for how to, how to optimize the marketing of each of those. Um, and we had five major events happen in the last three or four months that we believe will really be an inflection point for revenue. The first, and we've talked about these. The first one was um, the significant clinical and pharmacoeconomic efficacy in the NICU that we're seeing. That's been presented at scientific conferences, but it's not yet out in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, I didn't mention the partnership that we, um, that we made with Reckitt Benkheiser. They own Mead Johnson Nutrition, so a major worldwide uh, infant nutrition company with a major market share in the U.S. as well. It's a, it's a co-marketing um, uh, co uh, or co-promotion agreement. And so we basically increased our sales force by an order of magnitude. So now we have access not only to the hospitals, but through their uh, system of contacts to new moms around the US, we got access to probably 75 to 80% of the 4 million new, new babies that are going to be born every year in this US. So that's going to be a huge uh, access uh, ability for us. Partnership with j and you know, one of the largest healthcare companies in the world um, for this reduction of atopic dermatitis shows their confidence in working with, with uh, Evolve and the Avivo product to get a positive outcome in terms of a clinical trial, which is costing them millions and millions of dollars. Uh, we talked about the lab court decision to change and adjust the um, infant stool pH range and a recognition that over 95% of the babies that we thought were healthy, <laughs> they are now, but they're in a position where they're, they have a high prevalence for um, food allergies, atopic dermatitis, which possibly can be changed. And so that paper is gonna be coming out uh, also in the next uh, few months or so. Based on growth trajectories of companies uh, that I'm familiar with and that are in a similar space, MarTech, I was a founder of MarTech and was there right through their IPO and through their inflection point. Prolacta, you may be aware, is a company that uses uh, human milk, uh, deconstructs it, and then puts it back together again and sells it exclusively to the uh, neonatal intensive care units. Um, they kind of chiggered along with their sales until they, uh, they had their first publication that showed that it reduced um, NICU stay by two and a half days, and then they kind of exploded. Um, up they went. Uh, so we anticipate following that same curve and through that same curve driving revenues to the 200 million range in the next three years. So big picture is kind of for Evolve as a double bottom line. It's basically a significant investment returns, but also, um, uh, and maybe more importantly for some, improving the lifelong health outcomes of all babies worldwide. And, um, and that's, our, that's our focus. Uh, and this is my last slide, so I leave my um, email there for you if anybody wants to get around to your questions, Anna, um, then um, please send me your questions and I'll be happy to answer you. If you're interested in any more information on the company, I can provide that. Great, and, and congratulations on all your progress and for sharing the incredible science behind this company. It's been really interesting and engaging. Um, Bruce, I see that you raised your hand. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. 
And while I do that, um, I just want to note to everyone here that if you want to raise a question or ask a question, you can raise your hand um, kind of through the sidebar tool, or you can also type your questions into the Q&A box that you find kind of in the bottom middle of your screen. And Bruce, you might have to unmute you if you want to talk um, on, on kind of your end. That's not like Bruce to be quiet if that's Bruce German. <laughs> oh. Well, unsure about that. Well, I'll kick off the I'll kick off the questions. Um, so uh, one of one of the questions I kind of have uh, based on this presentation is, you know, how do you really kind of work to, I guess, engage engage both new mothers and NICUs? You mentioned that you had established um, kind of a standard of care in NICU for your product, but what was kind of the, the the level of education that you have to establish both with mothers and NICUs to kind of get to that level? Well, that's a good question. Actually, two questions with two very different answers because they're different customer base. There's actually a third customer base in there and that's pediatricians as well too. <clears throat> the NICUs are really um, run by neonatologists and I think um, most of the pediatric community looks to the neonatologists as kind of the, not the research folks, but the people that are at the cutting edge uh, because they have different issues that they're dealing with with these very tiny newborn babies and their job is really just to get them through the, the um, uh, the preterm period as safely and as healthily as they possibly can. And so they're looking at all new information. And so our approach with the, with a hospital would be to <clears throat> set up a presentation to the, to a group of the um, neonatologists there or pediatric nurses, get them familiar with the, with the uh, disruptive concepts that we're presenting, because they are basically disruptive. No one, we're now just starting to think about the gut microbiome and its impact on the entire body, uh, let alone or, organ systems like the immune system. But um, they're very open and, uh, and good scientists and really understand the, science, understand the literature. So if they, if they like the story, I think that's why they will, they will move to, um, you know, well, let's try this as standard of care. They also listen to each other. So um, it helps when you have the first few hospitals using the product and you can say, is so-and-so is using the product, please give them, give them a call, see what their experience is, so on, so on and so forth. So that helps, um, but we're a small company, right? We have only 45 employees or so and, um, and, that, and a very small sales force. And that's why this partnership with Reckitt just gave us such an increase in scope and depth to be able to set up those meetings uh, with the neonatologists. The moms, on the other hand, are, are interesting. Um, um, they are really also almost as much focused on, uh, on the science, and many of them are very smart, and they, can, they have access to double-click down to get information off the internet. And so we do our best to supply on the website, um, uh, www.evivo.com, uh, the information that goes as deep as you want to the scientific discovery level. And, uh, and so we find that that's really important for moms too. So it's not just marketing, it's, it's marketing with answers to solve the mom's problems. And, and so we reach out through both our own website and when, when, they, when we can get them to the website, getting them to that website, uh, again, Reckitt will help us or me, Johnson helps us with their ability to contact you know those four million families every year that are having babies to get our information there as well too social media is a big thing also for new moms and moms groups um, and so we do our best to get into get our information into those there's other uh, webs uh, websites um, baby websites and things like that that uh, we try to get information uh, directly to moms as well too so two two different customer bases and two different approaches Great, and, and thank you for sharing those approaches. Next, we have a question from Meg Brigman. She's raised her hand. Meg, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. 
Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Awesome. Well, David, thank you so much. This talk was fascinating and I definitely learned a lot. I'd love to hear more about, you kind of mentioned these, the causes of this lack of bacteria is stemming from um, increased prevalence of C-sections and also um, not or higher antibiotic usage. Do yeah. you think, um, I mean, can you speak a little more to kind of how you've identified the, the correlations there and, and what significance do you think each of them has? Sure. I, I guess it, it, part of it came from the, a better understanding of how this was transferred in nature, because this isn't something new. This is something that has gone back for probably five million years. And uh, what is new is its disappearance and now having to put it back. Uh, so how was it originally transferred in nature? And, and it, we believe that it's always been in moms, um, but at a very low level. You know, there are lots of other bacteria. Once you, do, once you develop a, uh, a diverse um, uh, diet, uh, you'll have a very diverse gut microbiome. And so nothing's going to be there dominating unless you're in some sort of uh, uh, disease condition. So you'll have a very diverse diet, uh, microbiome. We believe that the bifidobacterium, there are certainly different species of bifidobacterium that are there occupying small nutritional niches in that gut microbiome. And we believe that, that uh, for the history of, of our race, we have always had a bee infantis in there to begin with as well too. So uh, when mom delivers, vaginally delivers, as the baby is being squeezed out through the birth canal, it also compresses mom's rectum and she defecates. It, she just it has been doing that for five million years. And um, in, a, in an environment of, of much lower hygiene, uh, one can imagine that it's very easy, sometimes we refer to this, it sounds funny, but the fecal veneer on our bodies, <laughs> that, um, that these organisms are everywhere and they eventually get into that baby. And once they get into that baby, if you can provide a selective growth medium for it, then it dominates and provides this colonization resistance, this protection against the uh, enteric pathogen um, uh, opportunistic colonization. So now if, knowing that that's the natural mechanism, one can understand how a C-section birth will um, obviate that. You, you're not going to be able to, if, even if mom had it in her, you won't be able to get it, get it through a C-section birth. Many moms that are delivering by um, vaginally uh, today in the U.S. are group B uh, strep positive, and so they're getting antibiotics. And so once they get an antibiotic, that's going to, again, destroy very quickly bif any bifidobacteria that are there in her gut. The repeated use, again, this statistic from CDC of 15 to 20 cycles of, of antibiotics, and we know from, from literature also that the uh, adult gut microbiome in the U.S. has only about half the diversity of the adult, adult gut microbiome of the, of the Yanomami tribe, for example. So we've lost this diversity, most of which comes from, um, from uh, antibiotic use. Uh, and we can actually measure mom. We can, we can measure the stool fractions of the moms and we do not find the B infantis in their stools today. Now, we would have thought that it would be there at extremely low levels, so it's still hard to identify. But um, I think it's really the antibiotic issue that's the most problematic. Uh, but certainly C-sections uh, are a problem too. Does, does that help, Meg? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that. I think um, it's just an interesting, interesting problem to have discovered and then kind of figured out the, the root cause of why it's not there anymore. So thank you for that. Oh, you're very welcome. The, the, good news, the good news in all of this is that the solution is really simple. <laughs> it's just um, went, went through the, went through the uh, you know, our... our uh, the un unexpected consequences of modern medical practices, which we don't want to go away. They save lives. We want to keep them here. But just right. knowing the problem, uh, the solution is just like add it back. Exactly. Great. And we, we have kind of a, a bit of a follow-up or related question from Jeanette uh, Gehrig. She was really curious about, about studies that, that, tra that show kind of direct transmission from mother's gut to infant's gut, especially in developing countries. Um, but she also wonders, how do you think the infantis persists or is able to in, in the adult gut? Okay, two questions there. And, and, and Jeanette, we're also doing lots of work on, with the Gates Foundation in Bangladesh, and as did the, uh, the founder team 
uh, and still from the University of um, California at Davis doing a lot of work. Uh, that the populations are certainly there. It's very clear as published literature now uh, showing that, uh, you know, the healthy babies in Bangladesh have uh, a gut microbiome that is dominated at 75 to 80% with, um, with B. infantis. Uh, and that might represent um, uh, in one particular trial, 75% uh, or so of the babies, the other 25%, it was, it was much lower and missing. Interesting um, result from that trial is they were looking at the response to vaccinations and they found that if the bifidobacteria was missing, there was a significantly blunted effect on the vaccine responses, not only at the first uh, six months of life, but also at two years of life. So it, it, it is there and it may be disappearing because we're, we're moving in to treat um, you know, enteric diarrheal diseases with antibiotics. And that is having, again, an unintended consequence of, of um, eliminating potentially the, the B. infantis from that population. But it will be, you know, there's probably uh, more than a thousand, less than 2,000 different species inhabiting your gut microbiome now. And it's, uh, they're there in very small amounts and they've occupied very small selective nutritional niches. Uh, and it could be that um, this B. infantis, uh, one thing that we know now is that it also nibbles on glycosylated proteins. Uh, it can't nibble on glycosylated mucin because that's bound by what's called an O-linked, an O-linkage to the carbohydrate. But any N-linked uh, glycans in proteins, uh, it does have an enzyme in it that can clip that off and consume, and consume that as food. So it doesn't have to live on um, milk oligosaccharides, uh, and, which may have been the root of your question because uh, once, once we are weaned, we probably will never get milk oligosaccharides again in our diet. Um, so the, the population decreases tremendously in number, but it still has a small nutritional niche that allows it to stay there unless it's hammered by an antibiotic. I'm not sure I answered the question, I hope I did. <laughs> I think so, yes, thank you. Um, and we, we have another question from John. John asks, what is the biggest risk or threat in terms of liability? Um, are there any potential negative side effects or misuse? Yeah, good. that's a good question, John. It's something we've obviously thought about a lot. Um, but again, returning to the natural condition uh, and knowing that this exists naturally in populations that really have been untouched by, um, by modern civilization, um, we have to know that it's, it's inherently safe. It's, it's certainly been developed by nature to carry out a very specific purpose. And so by adding it back to the baby as opposed to, it's not something that's new and that's not supposed to be there. It's something that has gone away by mistake. Um, so there is really no, um, the, the liability is putting things back the way they were. So I'm going to get back to that question in just a second. Um, but first mention, you know, is there anything, I think, the root of your question may be, can you like overdose this or underdose this? Or uh, if you're thinking like a pharmaceutical, how can that have some other side effect by an overdose? Well, with a, with a live organism like this, it's, um, it actually grows in the gut microbiome up to a level that it, where it reaches an equilibrium and then it stops. Uh, so it, uh, it's very consistent in what it does. It's, it's a natural me mechanism that was, uh, was actually developed for that purpose. So, so you know, if Bruce German is on the on the line and he could and he could uh, mention this, so I'm going to steal a, a quote from from Bruce, which is um, which is that the world has has undertaken um, unintentionally a micro my, micro gut microbiome remodeling experiment in our babies over the last hundred years by changing it from what it was naturally to something new unintentionally. However, if that was done as actually a clinical trial, I'm sure it would have been stopped after the first five years that we start seeing increased prevalence of uh, food allergies and increased prevalence of, of um, asthma. I mean, those are, those are untoward side effects of the original of, of, of our population today. And so what we're actually trying to do is eliminate that. Unless, some, unless there's some advantage of having uh, our selective advantage of having asthma or a selective advantage of having type 1 diabetes, I would think it should be, we should be thinking of it in context of the opposite. Great. 
Great. Perfect. Well, we've kind of reached the end of our hour, and I want to thank you, David, for joining us today and, and really providing an, an excellent pre presentation that's very interesting and engaging. Um, so thank you to the audience, and, and thank you to David. Well, thank, thank you, Hannah. And if anybody in the audience uh, knows of somebody who's about to have a baby, you're about to have a baby, you're about to have a grandchild, whatever, um, lead them to the Evivo website and let them um, make their own decisions. But it's, uh, I think it's a, a great, it'll be a great gift to your child. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. We host these calls every week at three o'clock central. You can register for the AgriFood Conversations webinar series by going to agrifoodconversations.com. A replay of this webinar will be emailed to you in the next 24 hours. And if you know others that may want to see this webinar in replay or learn more about uh, eVivo and, and its background, they'll be able to access uh, it on the agrifoodconversations.com in the next 24 hours. David, thank you and, and thank you to all the attendees. Thank you.